this week in lab, we're going to be doing experiments five and six. The actual doing, which I'll explain here in lab lecture, is mainly from experiment six. Experiment five teaches you about IR spectroscopy, so we'll cover that as well, and then you'll use the instructions at the back to collect IR spectra. Um, you have a quiz this week, so make sure you are ready for that. Um, your experiment three lab report is due this week, so again, we'll be taking your um, notebooks at the end of the lab period, so make sure you come with your lab report ready to go. Um, next week, we're going to start um, experiment seven. So experiment seven is a two-week experiment. Um, we're going to be doing the first part of it next week, but the pre-lab that you come with for next week needs to be the entire pre-lab. So make sure when you're preparing the pre-lab that you um, do have the whole thing, the whole parts of the experiment, or actually there's actually three parts of the experiment, but two weeks, have it all ready to go. And next week in lab lecture, I'll give you some information for that pre-lab too, that'll hopefully help you out. So um, this week we're going to be talking mainly about experiment six. Like I said, we'll talk about experiment five here in a little bit, but experiment six, you're going to get another unknown. And this time you don't have a list like you did with experiment one of what are your possibilities um, that are going to be in that unknown. You, you don't have a list of possible compounds. You just have functional groups. So that unknown could be an alkane, an alkyl halide, an alkene, an alcohol, or a ketone. Okay, so we'll have one, one of these functional groups, and like with in Talking about alkane, that just means that it's all saturated carbons and hydrogens, okay? There's no other functional group in it. Now, the other groups here will have alkyl portions in them, but they will also have one of these functional groups in it, okay? Um, and you're not going to get a mixture of like an alkyl halide and an alkene, or an alcohol and an alkyl halide. It'll just have one of these, okay? Um, so we need to talk about how we're going to figure out what is in this unknown. So there's a series of steps you're going to run through. Starting with, we need to determine physical constants. And in this case, depending on what the unknown is, a liquid or a solid, we need to figure out what its boiling point or melting point is. Okay. So melting point, you guys all should be really good at figuring out melting points now. But boiling point, we have not done that yet. We have observed what the boiling point is of a solvent in a simple distillation, but we haven't actually characterized something by its boiling point, okay? So this week, you guys are going to use, you're going to use this all-in-one simple distillation apparatus. So this part here, is all one piece that is in your drawer, okay? Um, and so you'll clamp it, You'll, if you have a liquid, you will stick your liquid in this um, all-in-one simple distillation apparatus. Use your stemmed funnel so that when you're putting it in, it doesn't come out the side arm, okay? Put your stir bar in there, um, and then you're going to attach your side arm test tube with the stopper that should be on the arm of this um, all-in-one simple distillation apparatus. You also have a stopper in your common equipment drawer that's going to be used to get your thermometer into your um, apparatus. So you can't use the adapter that you have been using, you have to use the stopper that is in that common equipment drawer, okay? And so you're, you don't know what the boiling point is if you have a liquid, you just are going to slowly heat it to figure out what it is, okay? So you'll have to, you can't just use a hot water bath, you have to use the heating mantle and an omite because you may have a boiling point higher than hot water. Um, you're just going to slowly heat it. And what you want to determine is the boiling point of your, um, the consistent boiling point of your um, unknown but you also want to purify it, okay? So what you're going to do is, before you put on this sidearm test tube, 
is you want to very lightly clamp onto here a test tube to collect anything that comes off before it gets to a consistent boiling point, okay? And that's what we'll call as the pour run. So anything that's um, not consistently leveling out and boiling at a consistent boiling point, you're going to collect separate from the bulk of your unknown that should have a consistent boiling point. Now the thing with the test tube is the sidearm gives us an opening to this apparatus, okay, so that we don't have a closed system. If you put a test tube on here, you can't clamp it tightly onto the stopper because then you do have a closed system. So just be careful how you put, put your test tube on there, okay? Um, and then at the end of the distillation, you don't ever want to distill anything to absolute dryness. You could cause a fire by doing that. So you want to leave a little bit of liquid in the very bottom of the simple distillation apparatus, okay? Um, now do um, be careful. You want to, you know, carefully heat it, but you don't want to, like, if you have a liquid, this shouldn't take hours and hours just to get the distillation done. So you, you need to be careful, but not so careful that you're not getting enough heat to it so it can boil, okay? So you got to be careful, but at the same point, vigilant on moving up the heat as you're watching it to make sure that it does get to its distillation as boiling point, all right? And we'll show you how to set this up um, in, in lab this week, um, but things you should, besides boiling point range, you should um, also observe how much um, initial impure forum that you collect, how much purified unknown that you collect, things like that. Um, the other thing is some of the unknowns are very volatile, so once you have collected its boiling point range, in the sidearm test tube, or if you put it in a vial, probably even better, keep it covered so it doesn't completely evaporate on you. Because if, it, if you lose your unknown just because it evaporated on you because you didn't keep it covered, it'll cost you five points to get another unknown, okay? So be careful in handling your unknown. Okay, so we've got determine our boiling point or melting point. The next thing we're going to do is what's called a vial shine flame test to see if we have halogen or not. And so everybody should do this because you won't know if you have an alkyl halide or not unless you do this test. Okay. And so what, what should um, happen is it's a flame test like you did in Gen Chem, except for we're using um, copper wire, and you're going to clean the wire and then put your unknown on the wire and then put it into the flame. And what you should see is a green flame is indicative of the copper and the halogens reacting, okay? And so a green flame is a positive result. And sometimes it takes it doesn't instantly turn green. Sometimes it takes a second or two before you see the green. Um, but the other thing is make sure you clean the wire well so that you don't have the result of the person before you that had a halogen and you don't actually have a hal halogen. So be careful with that, but we'll show you in lab this week um, how to do this test and what, what you need for the setup of the test. Then the next thing is we're going to determine the solubility properties of your unknown. And with this test, we want to be careful. We need the unknown that we collect the boiling point and purify with, with our um, determination of physical constants, we need it for all the rest of the tests as well. So you want to make sure in experiment in number three, you're not using up all the unknown that you have available to you, okay? So we should be using at most one mil of the solvent you're testing and a couple drops or a couple milligrams of unknown, okay? So it shouldn't take um, tons of unknown to figure, figure these things out. If you're not sure what if it's soluble in the solvent or not, then add another drop, but don't add a bunch to it to figure it out, okay? Just, just be thinking of drops when you're 
looking at solubility properties. So in your lab manual, there is a table for doing the solubility test. And what you want to be looking for, so that the solvents that you're going to use for the solubility test are water, which out of the tap water, diethyl ether, which is in the red cans, the HCl and NaOH is still in the reagent hood, and then there's also concentrated sulfuric acid in a drop of bottle in the reagent hood. Be really careful with this. It is concentrated. It's 18 molar sulfuric acid, so you don't want to get it on yourself because you burn yourself pretty badly with it, okay? So be really careful with it, and if any does get spilled in the hood or drip, dripped in the hood, we need to clean it up so the next person doesn't um, get hurt with it as well, okay? So wear gloves handling that guy. What you are looking for with the solubility tests are what pattern are you getting with your unknown? And that then will help you figure out what possible chemical class you have based on how it performed in the solubility tests, okay? So you wanna use a new test tube for each one of these tests and you wanna follow the tests in order, okay? Now, if you get something that follows, like for example, you get a positive water test and negative diethyl ether, these symbols mean you're not going to do the rest of these tests, okay? So you gotta follow the pattern, and if it tells you not to do a certain test, that means don't do the test, okay? So don't do it just to see what happens. You wanna not do the test. If based on the pattern that you come up with, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, a lot of that has to do with reactivity and um, things with the acids and bases, so we don't want you to have a poor or unexpected reaction with your unknown, that, that is why you're not going to continue on with the solubility test depending on what pattern you come up with, okay? So this would be a really good thing to have in, in your notebook as well as have that um, available in, in your lab manual, okay? So then the next thing, um, I'm gonna get, get this guy started for a second here. I'm going to show you some things with that. Um, we are going to learn how to collect IR spectra. And so the interpretation of your IR spectrum is going to help you figure out what your unknown is. Okay? And so what you're looking at with this IR spectrum is your trying to figure out the chemical class or functional groups present in your unknown. And in the end, what you want to do is when you determine what unknown you have, when you tell your instructor the unknown is this, your IR spectrum and the IR, IR spectrum of the literature thing you say it is should be a match. So we're going to show you in a little bit what that means, okay? But you want, you want to have a match of experimental <coughs> IR spectrum and lit IR spectrum. So I'm going to show you a couple databases that you can use for finding that, that
the compound. And then down here, so if you hit enter, it won't start searching. You actually have to hit search. It will then come up with what information it has on the database, okay? And so what we are interested in is we want to actually get the IR spectrum, okay? And so we're going to click on the Y for the IR spectrum. So if it says N, that means the IR spectrum for that compound is not available in the database, okay? Um, what you want to be looking for is a liquid or a meat or a liquid film, okay? You do not want it to say gas phase or vapor phase up here, or hopefully not a, um, in a mixture of anything, okay? So you want a liquid or neat um, or liquid film IR spectrum, all right? Then what you have to do is you kind of have to trick this, and so you've got to um, copy the image, actually copy image URL, I think is what works, and then Open image in the new tab, that's what we want. Okay. Then from the image as a new tab, you would print out this literature spectrum if this ends up being the compound that you say say you will, you think your unknown is. Okay? So part of what you will hand in with experiment six is the literature IR spectrum of what you are identifying your unknown <coughs> as. Okay? Um, The next um, database that you're going to use is in any computer lab that is a generic computer lab. So like the Duck Computer Lab 3002, um, even 3101, which is kind of on the side of the chemistry secretary's office, or the dorm computer labs, or the library computers, will have the same computer programs available. Okay, so if you go under chemistry and go, so all programs, chemistry, all your spectral viewer, this is another option for finding literature IR spectrum. Okay, and so what you do is you go under, it always default comes up with butane. Okay, we don't want butane. So you got to go under the icon that has the question mark and you're going to type the compound that you're looking for. And then, um, and you could also turn it, type in the CAS number, catalog number, formula. So the CAS number is it, the compound's unique number. Each compound that's been identified and fully characterized has its own unique number. The catalog number is the Aldrich catalog number, because this is from Aldrich, um, the database is from Aldrich, or its chemical formula. So then you're going to hit execute. Oh, we don't have. There we go. So you may have a big list of compounds. You would just want to click your arrow to be right next to the compound that you're interested in. Say high search results. And then it's going to come up with the data for that specific compound. So I've got one from pentane here. I want to click, you want to see that this is bold and not grayed out. If it's grayed out, it means that there's not an IR spectrum for that compound. Click on the IR spectrum, and you want to see that it says neat or liquid or liquid film here, okay? And then the other thing that we need to do besides just going to print it is we need to mark on here. So the STBS website had a table of all of the um, wave numbers for the, the frequencies for the peaks in the IR spectrum. We need those marked on here. So how you do that is you go to this tool here, and then you can click on this threshold tool, and it just moves up and down. So you want to put it as high as you can to mark the peaks that you want, and then it will mark any peaks it has data for, okay? And so then go under print. You want to make sure that you click print peaks on spectrum, and then say okay, so that those peaks are then listed for you. If you also wanted the peak table, you could ask for that as well, okay? 
So this would be considered a literature spectrum as well. The other place that um, you can look for a literature spectrum is the government website. And so I'm going to give you that now. Um, it's the NIST database. And its website is, um, there's no www, okay? So it's http colon slashes web book with two b's dot nist dot gov backslash chemistry and that um, there you can when you go to this website then it'll give you an option for searching for the compound you search for the compound and then it'll give you all of the data that it has for that particular compound, okay? The only thing, reason I would pick, the only reason I would pick the other databases first is um, IR spectra under this database doesn't mark the frequencies on the spectrum. So you have the spectrum and you have the grid for the spectrum, but you don't have the actual frequencies. You, you're going to have to approximate the frequencies. So I'd use SCVS or the Aldrich Spectral Viewer first, but if that doesn't help you, then, then go to NIST. Okay? Um, so then the next thing we're going to do is chemical characterization tests. And so we're going to test we're going to test for these specific functional groups. So we've kind of already given you one of those, which is the Bielstein flame test, although we kind of pulled that out as a flame test versus these other um, tests that I'm going to show you. And so let me just put up, I'm going to put this overhead up and then we're going to talk about um, each of these tests. Okay. All right. So for the alkenes, there are two tests. There's bromine test and a potassium permanganate test. So the first test that is up there is the bromine test. And this is an example of an electrophilic addition to an alkene. You're going to start with something that's clear and colorless. Okay, This is your unknown, your unknown alkene. Then you're going to add bromine to it. And this is in solution. It's an orange-red color. So then, um, what should happen if this is a positive test, the bromine's going to add across this double bond. <coughs> and you guys will cover in lecture the reason that it adds the way it does, okay, when you cover alkenes. it doesn't add on the same side as the double bond based on the mechanism. A positive test would be you still see this clear colorless compound. Okay? So what happens is you've got clear and colorless, you add this orange red to it, it reacts and goes back to clear and colorless. All right? So a positive result in the end, once you've added the bromine, you go back to where you started because you're reacting across this double bond. Okay? Um, and so what you're going to be doing is counting how many drops it takes before you turn to an orangish color, orange red color. Okay? So you're looking for when does the orange red color start to persist, persist and stop fading when you add to it. 
Now, after about 20 drops or so, if you've added 20 drops and it still keeps going clear and colorless, you can count this as a positive test, okay? So you don't need to keep just adding and adding and adding and using up more bromine solution when you know you've got a positive result. If you add a couple drops and it stays clear and colorless and then add a couple more and it stays orange, that most likely is probably a negative result, okay? Now the key with the bromine and the permanganate test is you need both and you need positive results in both to say that you have an alkene. And here, here's why, okay? Because there's another reaction that can take place with the bromine test. It can actually perform a radical substitution reaction on alkanes. So this is, given any light or heat, most likely you're giving it light, you shouldn't be heating these solutions. The proton is going to be substituted for the bromine, okay? And again, it's a radical reaction that takes place, and you'll, when you get to those, you'll look at similar reactions in the lecture. So you form um, this um, brominated alkane, and then you also give off HPR gas, all right? And so again, you're most likely going clear and colorless. You add something that's orange-red. You're going to still be clear and colorless until you added too much bromine for this to happen. What you are going to do with both of these tests is you're going to test the pH paper as you're adding it. So at the tip of top of your test tube, you're going to have a little bit of pH paper in the top. You're going to um, want to see if you get this HBr gas evolution. All right. So in this case, we shouldn't have something super acidic. In this case, we, we um, should because you'll have the evolution of the HBr gas. The thing to be careful of is don't base all your results just on the pH paper because this can be a little bit tricky, okay? So this reaction can really happen and can really happen with some of the unknowns, but it also can be kind of a tricky reaction. So don't, don't go against the fact that it looks like you have a positive result and you get a positive permanganate test but the pH paper was red, you decide that it was negative for alkenes and this was probably what happened. Most likely, if you got a positive here and a positive for, for manganate, you have an alkene, okay? And what should happen is these character, char characterization tests, the chemical characterization tests, should be affirmed what you see with the IR. So you're testing for the same thing. What chemical class do you have? They should agree with each other. Okay, so now, permanganate test, um, you're still, still going to have addition across that double bond. So again, it's starting with something clear and colorless. Now you're going to add potassium permanganate, so the same as the potassium permanganate you used in Gen Chem. Um, and what happens when it adds across the double bond is you form a diol. And this actually does add to the same, same side. Okay? So you get your diol. This is also clear and colorless. Your permanganate, if you remember, is really deep purple. That's why you only use a drop or two of it turn things so dark you can't see. But what it fo forms as a byproduct is um, manganese dioxide. This is a brown precipitate, okay? And so in this reaction, you've got your clear colorless alkene, you add this purple solution, you react, form this clear colorless product, you get this brown precipitate, that purple should be fading as you're forming this brown precipitate because you're consuming the potassium permanganate, all right? So you want purple fading, brown precipitate forming, then you've got a positive result for the permanganate test. If it just stays purple and you don't see this brown precipitate, then most likely it's not a positive result. But wait about three to five minutes for this test. It sometimes takes a few minutes for, for it to react. 
So the bromine test should be pretty, pretty immediate, but this may take a few minutes. So you'll add your permanganate, let it sit a couple minutes, and then check your results, all right? And again, you have to have a positive bromine test and a positive permanganate test to say that you have um, an alkene. For the alcohols, we're going to use serac ammonium nitrate. Also known as the CAN test. And so serac ammonium nitrate, this is serac ammonium nitrate. So it's a complex in itself. And it forms a complexation reaction, so there's not really a reaction to show. But it complexes um, with the alcohol. So you get something kind of like this. But there's no true reaction that you're going, going to show with it. Okay? So you can list this as a positive, or list this as a test, but you don't have to show a reaction for this test in your pre-lab. Um, with the serac ammonium nitrate test, what you are looking for is a color change from kind of a yellowish solution to more of a ready orange solution, okay, for the serac ammonium nitrate, all right? And it depends. You have to be careful. If you have a water-soluble alcohol, then you just use water for the test. If you have a water-insoluble alcohol, then you have to use THF as your solvent. Um, so you want to do the solubility test before you do this test so you know if you're soluble in water or not. Okay. Then for the ketones, we've got 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine test. <coughs> And so what's happening with that is you've got a ketone, okay? And it is reacting with this hydrazine. So here is the hydrazine part. Okay, this is our hydrazine. Here's our dinitrophenol portion. So we've got two and four. So there's two. Sorry, two, four. Okay? And what you're going to form is, and this is in sulfuric acid and ethanol, be careful with it because it was concentrated sulfuric acid was used to make this. So you don't want to get it on you. Wear gloves, and in general with this experiment, wear gloves handling the unknowns. You don't know what they are. Wear gloves handling the chemical test reagents and make sure you do everything in the hood. Um, you form what is called a hydrazone, okay? So here's what was from your unknown. Now it is formed the hydrazone. And this is a yellow-orange precipitate. So sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's orange, sometimes it's a little in the middle. But it's definitely a really easy to see precipitate, okay? Now one thing with this test as well as other tests, acetone is a ketone, right? Make sure you don't contaminate your stuff with acetone, otherwise you'll get false positive tests. Acetone will also react with bromine, so you'll get a false positive test with a bromine test too, okay? So be careful with your tests. Do not get any acetone in contamination with what you're trying to test and with the chemical test reagents, okay? All right, so then um, the sixth part of our whole steps here is our literature search. And so in the back of your lab manual, are tables of compounds. This is 
one, one page of many pages, okay? So here's some alcohols that are listed. They are listed in order of melting point and then boiling point, okay? And then these are derivatives. You don't need to worry about these two columns, okay? Um, so what you are looking for is you're going to look at the compounds that melted or boiled within 10 degrees of what you collected for that data, okay? So 10 degrees above, 10 degrees below. Look at that group of compounds, and you're going to then look up that group and see what IR spectrum matches that with the IR spectrum you collected. So to get to this point, you need to have completed all these steps, and you need to have your melting point or boiling point, and know for sure the chemical class of your unknown because these are all divided first by chemical class, and then, like I said, melting point and boiling point, okay? And so that is where you will find your um, unknowns. Another place that you could possibly find them is called the Handbook of Tables of Organic Compounds, well, Organic Compound Identification. This book is in 3123. It has a lot of useful information in it, but be careful because it's really, it's seen better days, okay? So just be careful handling it so the pages don't, it doesn't completely disintegrate on you, okay? But first you want to try back of your lab manual first, okay? Before you're going to this guy. And so basically, those, those are the steps. So in your in your lab manual, here basically are those same steps spelled out. Okay. So for your pre-lab for experiment six, things will be a little bit different. Okay. You do need a purpose. You need um, the chemical test reactions. So you need to show three of those. The can test you don't need to show. You can just list that it's a complexation. Um, you need to have your physical data table with the chemical test reagents. And the solubility test reagents. You need to make sure that you um, have a flow chart. You should show new equipment. So the new equipment is that all-in-one simple distillation apparatus. Um, and then make sure you show references. sure you do have that all together before you come come to lab this week. All right. Okay, now I'm going to quickly transition over over again to experiment 5 which tells us um, about IR spectroscopy. If you remember our, um, as far as the table of energy and possible um, different different types of energy in the electromagnetic spectrum, we've got infrared is on one side of the visible spectrum, visible, or we've got the visible spectrum in the middle, and then ultraviolet on the other side. Okay. IR spectroscopy, you're looking at, it's really, remember on this end is lower energy, this is higher energy. You're looking at lower energy than UV, okay? So IR spectroscopy, you're going to be looking at what happens when you um, give 
energy to a compound, it's going to be having, or it's going to be not reacting, but you're going to see differences in the bonds um, and therefore get chemical class functional groups out of it, okay? So it's not, it's not high energy. It's going to make bonds move or absorb energy in a certain way, but it's not going to be ultra, like ultraviolet. If you remember from Gen Chem ultraviolet, you're actually going to be removing protons. That's how high energy it is, okay? So we're relatively low energy when we're looking at IR. All right. And so with IR, we're going to look at what is happening on that bond. And the atoms that are there are um, as well as what type of bond you have, okay? So this is some examples of the different things that are measured um, with IR spectroscopy. And we're looking at the absorption of energy depending on what, what type of movement we're getting from those bonds, all right? And so you can have stretching, you can have asymmetrical stretching, scissoring, rocking, wagging, twisting. This is all on, um, from Wikipedia if you wanna look at it after, after class as well. But we're not doing any bond breaking, anything like that, okay? We're just looking at the bonds that are in that compound. How does it respond when you um, have different energy added to it? Um, and you're looking at usually 4,000 to about 600, 650 um, inverse centimeters or wave numbers or the frequency is between 4,000 and, and 600, okay? Um, but based on the different types of bonds and atoms that you have in a compound, you can figure out what kind of chemical class is there. So I'm going to show you kind of of the IR spectrum that we're looking at. Okay, so here's, in general, what, I, um, what type of bonds we would be looking at as we look at the different parts of the IR spectrum. And again, we're looking at usually 4,000 to 600. And usually what we're interested in is 4,000 to 1,400 because this is more um, diagnostic for the functional groups. This fingerprint region become specific for each type of bond in, in your compound. It becomes specific for the specific compound. So I'll show you in a minute how you use that. But as far as diagnostic and figuring out what functional groups are present, this is the region that we're, we're going to use, okay? And so you guys have um, that yellow sheet that I handed you in the back. So this would be what a IR spectrum would look like. This is ethanol IR spectrum. This is the yellow sheet that I handed out in the back. It's also posted on Moodle, but try and get a, a paper copy for yourself as well. But if you lose your paper copy, it is on Moodle. Um, so we're looking at things in that region of you know, 4,000 to 1,400. We go down here in the CH bending to about 1,380, 1,350, okay? So we're not going to be identifying things that are lower than the 13 hundreds as far as what functional groups are present, all right? That is what we call the fingerprint region. You also have um, this table in McMurray. It's a very similar table. It just gives more specific ranges for the different functional groups, whereas the yellow table is a little more broad to kind of catch all the outliers, okay? So you've got that table as well. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some spectra and show you what you should be looking at in order to figure out um, what chemical class you have. So this is an example of an alkene. If you're kind of looking at the yellow sheet and looking at this at the same time, it'll help make sense. 
but something that's really diagnostic of an alkene is this peak in the early to mid 1600s, okay? And it's not usually a huge, very intense peak, but it usually is there, although sometimes it is difficult to see. So the other thing is in this region, we're looking at the CH bonds. There should be around 3,000 or so an SB2CH stretch, okay? Now look at how I have label things on your IR, on the IR spectrum, you're going to want to do the same thing with your own once you figure out what you've got, okay? So I labeled the SP2CH. You all will probably have SP3CHs, and then what functional group beyond that? And we don't, we don't have anything else down here beyond 1300. So if you have other things from that yellow sheet you could identify like the CH bending, you'd want that labeled on there as well. Okay, so here's an example of an alcohol. Very indicative of an alcohol is this large, broad stretch in the 3,300 to about 3,000 range, sometimes 3,500 to about 3,000, 3,200. And then this alcohol is 2-butanol, so it also has SP3CH stretches. <coughs> and then it also has some CH bending. But this is very indicative of an alcohol. A ketone... So this is 2-hexanone. It has a very indicative stretch around upper 1600s, usually low 1700s, of the carbonyl group. So it's a very large, intense um, peak in the IR spectrum, so much more intense than the alkene stretch. You want to make sure, in this case, we label our SP3CH and then also our ketone, and then again, we could get down to the CH bending. Now, sometimes with alcohols, you have to be careful because they also can form ketones. But to say you have a ketone, you're probably going to have this very intense carbonyl stretch, not something way up at the top here. Now, here is an alkyl halide. It's bromopropane. It, um, all we have in the diagnostic region is the SP3CH stretch or any CH stretching, and then we could also show the CH bending. You don't have anything in the diagnostic region to show it's an alkyl halide. So you really need that um, good flame test to be able to figure out if you have one or not versus it being an alkane, okay? So be really careful for, for your flame test because there's not a lot of difference between it and looking at an alkane. Same, same thing, okay? So here's pentane, SP3CH stretch, and then CH2... Um, bending, but again, nothing really characteristic of it beyond that. So the thing with the alkanes in this experiment is basically the alkanes are going to be that one um, functional group that tests negative for everything, okay? It should have a positive flame test, and the CAN test, the DMP test, the bromine test, the permanganate test should all be negative. That's pointing at it being an alkane, and so you should see that in your IR spectrum. Now, where you're going to use that fingerprint region, okay, so I've got two alkanes here. They're both six carbon alkanes, all right? And they both have similar boiling points. One's at 62, one's at 69. They vary similar in the diagnostic region, but where they vary is in this fingerprint region, okay? Their fingerprint regions are very different. That's where you're going to use the fingerprint region to identify um, specifically that your unknown matches the literature spectrum that you say it is, okay? So when you say you have a match, that fingerprint region should match your fingerprint region of your experimentally collected unknown, right? Otherwise, if they don't match, then they're probably not exactly the same compound. They may be similar compounds, but they're not exactly the same. Okay, now as far as reporting IR data, you have a table at the back of experiment five. So experiment five tells you all about IR spectroscopy. It gives you a lot of examples. It also gives you the instructions for collecting an IR spectrum. So we'll show you how to use those in lab this week. The very end of it is an IR table. This is what you always wanna report when you report an IR spectrum, okay? When you characterize an IR spectrum, you always want to report an IR table. 
So whenever you collect an IR spectrum, always, always, always in your notebook, you're putting in a table once you fully characterize it. So you're gonna have the frequencies of um, the specific stretches that you're looking at, what literature frequency you have, what intensity or shape, so is it a medium and sharp, or is it a strong, very broad, what type, what, what does it look like? What does it do to? So it's a CH stretch or um, C double bond O or C double bond C. And then what does it correspond to? Is it an SB2 CH stretch or an SB3 CH stretch? Um, in this case, we had some CO2. You can see CO2 sometimes from the air, um, an alkene, things like that. So this table, you need to report every time you collect an IR spectrum. And pretty much not always, but most of the time, like 80-90% of the time, from here on out, whenever you do um, an experiment in organic lab, you're going to collect an IR spectrum. Okay. Now with the IR spectra, so in the very first week of lab, we talked about things you could do in open lab without um, getting your instructor's permission. So collecting a melting point, collecting a weight, collecting an IR spectrum is the third one. Okay, so now after this week, you'll know how to do that. All right. So last thing I'm going to show you is at the end of experiment six, you have report sheets that you're going to fill out for your unknown. Okay. So there's two pages, give all the information, draw the structure, what is it, physical properties, possible um, prod compounds you looked at, what happened in the flame test. Give a table and words summarizing your solubility tests. Summary of the character chem chem um, chemical characterization test. Here is your IR table. We've got it right here for you. Um, but you also should all put it in your notebook. And then you're also going to attach this, your IR spectrum, the lit IR spectrum, and your conclusion that you're going to write, so we'll give you more specifics in lab about this conclusion, as one big packet. That's what you will hand in for experiment six, as well as possibly your lab notebook, okay? So it'll be a little bit different report than what you've done so far. Okay, questions you guys have?